Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Um, thank you so much for being here. Some folk um, are, are still trickling in, but we want to make the most of the, the hour we have together. So um, I'm Alice from Engender. I'm just kicking off with a wee bit of housekeeping. Um, this is in webinar format, so don't worry, we can't see or hear you um, if you're attending. So feel free to eat your lunch, uh, deal with deliveries, uh, pets, children, anything that, that comes along. Um, so, and if you want to ask a question, we're using the Q and A function. So you should see some little, um, you should see some little speech bubbles at the bottom saying Q and A. So you can ask questions there, um, and we'll be passing them on to um, our chair, Talat Yakub, who will be asking them to our panel. Um, if you have any tech issues, then you can just use the chat box um, to to chat to Engender. Um, and if you have any tech issues, we know it happens, then please just try and rejoin on the link um, you were sent. And if not, you can drop us an email um, or uh, a DM on Twitter and we'll try and help you out as much as we can. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and pass over to our chair for the event, um, Talat Yakub, um, who we are absolutely delighted is joining us. Um, I'm not going to give you a full bio, Talat, um, but she is all around wonderful. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice um, and Engender Rape Crisis Scotland for inviting me along to be the chair today. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to see Laura after so long and be able to have a chat with her. Um, before we get started, I do think it's important that we acknowledge the context in which we're having this conversation in. Obviously, um, with the case of Sarah Everard um, and her murder and the reality of how raw and difficult and painful that is. Um, I don't know about you, but I found the last 24 hours, particularly online, really tough. And the reason I think it's hit us all so hard is because it feels um, close to home. We've all taken the um, longer route home, had our keys between our fingers, called our friends to, to let them know we've got home safe. That's a, that is a reflection of the epidemic of violence against women that we are surrounded by and have grown up in. I know for many of you, this will be raw and difficult, um, but at, in the same token, I think having this conversation may in some ways create some solidarity and help us think about the ways in which the system impacts us and the causes and consequences of this and what we can do to progress and create a society that's safer for women. So um, I'm glad that you're here. Um, I hope you're okay and I hope you get something out of it. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand over to Laura. Laura is the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, relentless feminist campaigner and um, author of Men Who Hate Women, which is the focus of the conversation today. Laura, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to read a short extract from the introduction to Men Who Hate Women. We don't like to risk offending men. We find it hard to think of straight white men as a homogenous group though it comes so easily when we think of other types of people, because we are used to affording such men the privilege of discrete identities. These men are complex, heroic, individual. Their decisions and choices are seen to spring from a set of distinct and unique circumstances because we see them as distinct and unique people. We don't mind talking about women as a group and about violence against women as a phenomenon, but we do so as if it is something that just happens. We don't, as a rule, talk about male perpetrators of violence against women. We describe a woman as having been raped. We discuss the rates of women sexually assaulted or beaten, but we don't speak in terms of men committing rape or being sexual assaulters and violent abusers. That's what makes it so easy to focus on women's dress, behaviour and choices when we consider sexual violence to warn women to take precautions to protect themselves and implicitly or explicitly blame those victims who do not. Because a rape is a shadowy dark thing waiting to befall women who walk in alleyways wearing short skirts, not a deliberate criminal choice made by real men. When we're forced to confront these men because high profile cases hit the headlines, we describe them as beasts and monsters in order to separate them clearly from those other ordinary, decent men among whom we walk every day. We don't count them, quantify them, or in any meaningful sense, study them. In fact, we rarely think about them at all. If we talk about masculinity, patriarchy or male privilege, the conversations are immediately derailed by accusations of generalization and prejudice. Not all men rises the ubiquitous cry. It's too simplistic, too offensive, too broad. 
yet we raise few such objections when the crimes of a man with brown or black skin are immediately assumed to be related to his race or religion. To speak ill of masculinity, to describe it in its current societal iteration as something problematic, is seen as an attack on men themselves. To question why some men behave in certain ways is viewed as an assault on all men and thus unacceptable. Yet the opposite is true. Those who speak of toxic masculinity are not criticizing men, but rather defending them, describing an ideology and a system that pressures the boys and men in our societies, in our families, to conform to unrealistic, unhealthy and unsustainable ideals. Crushing gender stereotypes are damaging to men as individuals, as well as to the society in which they live. Tackling this problem, dismantling these pressures, is a matter of life and death for our boys. They are toppling like dominoes into the chasm we leave behind when we tiptoe around and refuse to name the problem. But we don't like to offend men, so we don't mention it. We don't use the word terrorism when describing a crime of mass murder committed by a white man with the explicit intention of creating terror and spreaded hatred against a specific demographic group, even though that's the definition of terrorism, if the demographic in question is women. The man is just disturbed, deranged, a lone wolf. We use language that designates him an outlier, an aberration. We don't call his online journey a radicalization or use the word extremism to label the online communities in which he's immersed himself, though we would reach for those words in an instant when describing other similar types of crimes committed by other different types of men. We don't examine what led him to commit those acts or how he became so full of hate very relevant unfortunately to everything that we've seen in the last few days and the response that we've seen. Thank you Laura that's exactly what I was thinking just how important that passage you just read was how quickly the um, Twitter hashtag not all men um, was raised the victim blaming what what we call perpetrators compared to what we call survivors or victims. Um, really at the forefront of my mind, that was that was actually really raw, given everything that's going on right now, but such an important, important passage for you to read. Thank you so much for that. So tell me about, um, for those, of, many of us have read it, but for those who, who haven't, can you tell us a little bit more about what the, the book is about and what led you to write uh, Men Who Hate Women? Yes, so the book is about extremist communities that if they were about any other form of extremism, we would talk about as, as terrorism, um, types of grooming and radicalization that are happening every day, uh, but that we don't use those labels to describe. Um, I think if you're a woman on the internet, um, more so if you're a woman of color or a trans woman, um, more if you're a woman who's speaking out about sexual violence, I think many of the women on this call, I'm sure will relate to this. You are aware of these men because they get in touch. Um, so I've been aware of these communities for a long time. Um, since 2012, when I started the Everyday Sexism Project, within weeks I was receiving perhaps 200 rape and death threats in a single day and they've never stopped since. But there was an argument for a long time, particularly at the, at the beginning that we shouldn't validate these men's existence by talking about them, that we shouldn't give them the oxygen of publicity. And, and I largely felt that that was a persuasive argument, so I didn't tend to talk about them. What I did do is spend a lot of time working with young people in schools because a huge number of the Everyday Sexism Project entries came from young people and it seemed pragmatic that that was a good place to start tackling these issues. When I went into schools, they weren't always easy conversations, you know, there was resistance and confusion and awkwardness, of course. But there was a real shift perhaps two years ago in the responses from boys. Suddenly there was a real hardened, um, extremely resistant approach. They didn't want to engage in conversation at all. And they came already pre-prepared with ideas that I would describe as, as radicalization. They came believing that I was a feminazi who hated men. They came believing and quoting completely false statistics about false rape allegations be, being the vast majority, um, men being the majority of victims of domestic abuse, conspiracy theories about a kind of vast feminist conspiracy at the heart of our government and white men being the true victims of society. And these were attitudes that were very difficult to tackle because they were extremely ingrained. And when these boys started repeating the same fake statistics and coming out often with exactly the same quotes in schools from rural Scotland to inner city London, I suddenly started to recognize that they were being radicalized online by these extremist groups I'd been aware of for some time. 
And at that point, along with an increase in the number of men coming off the internet and acting out these fantasies of, of hatred of women in real life, increasing numbers of women being massacred and murdered by men acting in the name of these ideologies, even though it often wasn't reported in the press or designated a terror attack. At that point, it seemed to me that the argument that we shouldn't give these groups the oxygen of publicity largely fell away because actually they were doing very well for publicity all by themselves and the fact that we weren't aware of it actually was hindering our ability as, as parents as educators as a society to tackle the problem and to support the young people who were being drawn into it i'm, I'm, I'm nodding away because i can absolutely understand everything that you're saying and and one of the things that I'm quite curious about is that you said about two years ago you noticed a difference. So is that something, the findings through your book, that you found that it was about two years ago that it started in particular? What is it that you think was triggered two years ago? Well, I think there are a number of things. I think there's a, a real increase in the number of young people who are using social media to access their news. 90% of teenagers are on YouTube, for example, and most of them say that's where they get their news. I think there's been an increase in the sophistication of the techniques used by these groups online in the last couple of years in terms of ways of finding and reaching out to young people. So they're not just expecting young people to come to them, they're coming to gaming, body, uh, gaming live streams or bodybuilding forums. So they're becoming more adept, I think, at that form of radicalization. But of course, the last few years have also seen a huge uptick in media attention uh, on feminism. And I don't say an upsurge in feminism because I think that's false. I think the media has this kind of fake suggestion that feminism comes and goes, but it's really just when the media chooses to report on it and that work is still always going on. But we saw a big media spotlight on things like the women sharing their stories using the Me Too hashtag um, on, on these kinds of issues. And that has, emboldened I think the online extremists who will hold those up as examples of what they claim to be society starting to favour women over men although the reality obviously is, is no such thing. Can you tell us a little bit more about key findings whilst you were doing this research, whilst you were researching this book and publishing, what were your key findings? Well, I think the first thing is that these are a, a huge sprawling network of distinct but interconnected communities. Many people have never heard of them. The separate communities I look at in the book are incels or so-called involuntary celibates. These are men who believe that they are not getting sex from women and that women owe it to them, that it's their birthright as men and that women should be punished for not having sex with them. They believe in a day of retribution and incel uprising when they will go into the streets and massacre as many attractive women as they can. They believe and advocate that women should be kept as sex slaves. Um, and there's huge crossover, of course, between them and with other um, extremist online communities like the alt-right, like the far right, like white supremacists. So that's the first group. Then there are um, so-called pickup artists. This is a hundred million dollar international industry led by men who have often in, the, in many cases themselves boasted about committing rapes, who have publicly advocated for rape to be legalized on public property. And it's a completely unregulated industry that has a massive network of men following it, men in real life going along and paying thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars to be trained in techniques effectively to harass or even in the most serious cases to sexually assault women. Then there is a group of women who call them uh, men who call themselves men going their own way or MGTOW. These are men who believe that women are so toxic and damaging that men should cut them out of their lives altogether, that that's the only solution. Um, and men's rights activists who claim to talk about issues really affecting men, but in reality use these as a cover to spread conspiracy theories and false statistics about domestic abuse. They focus their entire energy on, on undermining and attacking women, for example, uh, advocating that Domestic Violence Awareness Month be renamed Bash a Violent Bitch Month. And I think the biggest finding of the book really was the sheer scale of these communities. So we are talking about these communities which are sprawling networks of communities, forums, blogs, websites, videos. And we're talking about each one of those and there are thousands of them, but each individual community or group having membership, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, very often in the tens of thousands. These are active members. There are very often thousands and thousands of people online at the time you visit. And that's not including the number of people 
who are just watching and consuming this content. To give you an idea of the scale of it, one MGTOW blogger alone has 70 million views on his YouTube channel. So we think of these as niche uh, internet ideologies affecting just a small number of people. And crucially, we think they have no offline influence. But the reality is, is actually very different. So first of all, we know that their ideology is being sort of smuggled into the mainstream through kind of respectable conduits. So we're talking about politicians who have in many countries in the US, in the UK and Australia are known to have met with or spoken at events with these groups, many known to have taken private meetings with these groups. In some cases, politicians have then come out of those meetings and changed policy as a result or spoken to the media and repeated the completely fake statistics with some suddenly a mainstream media platform. We see the media platforming these groups in the name of balance, um, often giving them a huge platform to spout misogynistic bile, often unchallenged. And the result is that their ideas are trickling down very successfully into society. So, for example, men going their own way, it sounds so bizarre, so ridiculous, but actually 27% of American men recently when they were polled said that they wouldn't have a one to one meeting with women in the workplace anymore because women make up false allegations of sexual harassment. So their ideas are actually very successfully penetrating the mainstream. And Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Christopher Wiley said that he knows that Steve Bannon deliberately targeted incels as a demographic for votes for Donald Trump. So these are men who are having an increasing impact politically and, and socially and culturally in our real lives. And I, it's, it's harrowing when you start talking about it in the mainstream, when you start talking about Steve Bannon and you start thinking about the steps that it has taken into the White House and beyond. And we've seen this with white supremacy and radicalization when it comes to um, racism and white supremacy. Although that said, still not getting the attention and the investigation that that deserves. Yeah. But can you tell me about the links that you found between white supremacy leading into this kind of uh, men who hate women uh, movement? Yes, so there is huge crossover in many different ways. You can see that many men's journey uh, to radicalization in neo-Nazi or white supremacist movements takes them through the manosphere. Many of the current leading lights of those white supremacist movements made their name in online misogynistic movements like Gamergate, for example. So you can see it in the trajectory of individual men's journeys. You can also see it in the language. Much of the language and the dialect of white supremacy actually comes from manosphere terms. They have a very complex um, entire lexicon really of their own that, that they have created and that they use, which makes it quite difficult to penetrate and understand these groups until you start to understand that. But they're also based on incredibly similar foundational tenets. So for example, white supremacists are obsessed with birth rates. They're obsessed with what they describe as replacement theory. They're obsessed with this image of, of invading hordes of non-white men depleting the dehumanized resource of vulnerable uh, white women. They're obsessed with the idea of forcibly sterilizing black women and women of color. They're forced with the they're obsessed with the idea of forcing uh, white women to become sex slaves who will breed uh, a supreme race. So you can't really separate these out and say that they're separate things because they're not. In many cases where there have been mass terror attacks like one in Germany, men have been members of both movements and the incel movement and the male supreme supremacist movements are hugely racist. So these men are not just furious that women aren't sleeping with them. They're particularly furious if women are sleeping with, with for example, black men. That's something that is a real target of their ire. The reason this really matters is because we can't tackle it if we keep seeing it as separate. And we really do, even at the kind of top level of policymakers, counter-terror organizations, they talk about these as if they're completely different forms of radicalization. But these groups are recognizing how it works in their favor to make the connection. So they very openly boast about using misogynistic extremism as a way to pull boys down a slippery slope towards white supremacy. They talk about the fact that they see it as an easier sell. They deliberately target boys of around 11 years of age. And they say, if we can indoctrinate them into anti-feminism and hatred of women, that's a gateway, essentially. And then we use that to pull them further on into neo-Nazism and white supremacy. They describe it as using adding cherry flavor to children's medicine to try and groom these boys using things like viral YouTube videos and Instagram memes. So it's a very sophisticated operation and they're very aware of those connections. But we are not, partly because we don't take white supremacy seriously as a terrorist threat, 
then because the male supremacy is, is not even on the radar, and even when it is, we fail to make those links between them. You, you mentioned there the term manosphere. For those who haven't had a chance to read the book, could you explain what that means? Yes, so the manosphere, which is not my term, and I think is a little bit problematic because much like other things that we add the prefix man to, think about man flu or man bag, it sort of suggests that this is something a bit silly and a joke when in reality it isn't at all. But that is the term that has been given to cover this kind of ecosystem, if you like, of different extremist misogynistic communities. If you've got the men's rights, the incels, men going their own way, trolls, pickup artists, and so on. Thank you. One of the things you speak about in the book is the impact of funding cuts on community centres and other initiatives which might give young men an alternative space somewhere else to go rather than online radicalisation. What does that mean now in the COVID world we now live in where everything is online? Well, we think that there is a real risk that this is, of course, pushing young people further into radicalisation. We don't have the statistics yet. Obviously, we're still living through this. Um, many of the feminist academic researchers who work in this sphere have found their work enormously hampered by the COVID childcare crisis, ironically. Um, but we do have a generation of young people who are now, now completely cooped up, spending hours of time online, often through no fault of parents who are in a desperate situation as well. Um, but it does, of course, make them more accessible. Um, you asked at the beginning, actually, about what, what has coincided with this uptick in kind of radicalization. And, and absolutely, that's another really important thing to say. It's the absolute slashing of funding for detached youth workers, funding for youth centers, 300 youth centers closing their doors. Um, the space is where young men could go offline in real life to get a sense of community, of belonging, of brotherhood, of purpose, all of those things that these communities very seductively pretend to offer them, those off on offline spaces have disappeared and, and of course that drives them in that direction if there isn't something there to replace them. But I think that parents don't realize what's going on when children are on their own in their bedtime for in their bedroom online for long periods of time. Um, I think we have this gulf at the moment. We're in a moment that's unique in history. It's never happened before. It will never happen again, where a generation of non-digital natives is parenting and educating a generation of digital natives. And that is a massive culture gap. And it means that many parents and teachers just aren't aware of the reality of the landscape of young people's online lives. If I try to talk about something like online porn with, with parents and teachers, often they think you're talking about a kind of internet version of a, an FHM or a Playboy centerfold. They don't recognize that we're talking about children under the age of 12 accessing the most mainstream, easily accessible online porn, which often shows women being hurt, being raped, being degraded, being humiliated. And you really see that when you go into schools, you talk to young people and it's really not uncommon to hear them saying, rape is a compliment really, it's not rape if she enjoys it. Um, to say that it can't be rape if it's your boyfriend because you have to have sex with your boyfriend, you just have to. Um, you know, in one school there was a rape case involving a 14 year old boy and a teacher told me that she'd said to this boy, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And that he had said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. So there's this, gulf in awareness of what's going on at all and, and that's really dangerous when young people are online unsupervised you know even if they're gaming you, you might think you know they're not they couldn't possibly be on an incel website they're just playing a game but in their earphones is somebody that they've never met before somewhere else in the world just dripping little breadcrumbs about women it starts simply it starts with sexist jokes with a couple of racist jokes and the young people who respond are then invited to join a live stream or a private chat room to chat to share tactics for the game. But then once they're in there, suddenly there are links to these different forums and groups and, and that's how they get them. Or on bodybuilding websites, which if you think about it, at first I thought this was really weird. It was one of the things that kind of unexpectedly showed up in my research that a huge amount of this stuff was happening on bodybuilding forums. I thought that was really odd. But then when I looked into the numbers, I realized that something like 90% of the people using these forums are actually teenage boys and younger teenage boys. So you've got there a ready-made group of young men who are really worried about masculinity and about portraying a very stereotypical idea of what masculinity looks like in our society of big muscles bulking up. Those are exactly the kind of boys who are quite likely to be most vulnerable to these extremists and these movements. So they're incredibly clever in targeting boys where we might not expect to find them. I'm, I'm, I'm taking in everything that you're saying and there's there's so much um, so much in there. And for those of us who've been working 
on feminist campaigning, on tackling um, societal inequality for so long, this won't be new to us, but the level, the, the extent of it might be overwhelming. One of the things that's quite difficult in what you, what you were saying there is making the link to those who are making policy decisions about the funding cut of the youth centre and linking it all the way to something that is a global epidemic. And often those two things seem very far away and the people who are making policy decisions and politicians don't see the link, don't join the dots. Yeah. What do you think needs to happen to help join those dots of people that think that these are disparate things that are somewhere in the internet but are a minority that we don't really need to be paying attention to? Well, I think that we need to force um, people to make these connections. We need to force them to be aware that these communities exist in the first place and to take them seriously because they simply don't at the moment. One of the groups I spoke to when I was researching the book, he said we would never portray our work to politicians as preventing radicalization and extremism, even though that's exactly what it is. And I asked him why, and he said, well, because we wouldn't get funded because how many MPs are members of those groups? And that might sound extreme, but actually within this book, I've uncovered men who are serving politicians who have secretly online been running websites explicitly devoted to these groups. One man, for example, who was a state representative in the US, and that was his public face. Privately, he was writing online about how, um, you know, rape wasn't all bad because at least the rapist enjoyed it. Uh, how all feminists just wish that they were attractive enough to rape. Um, a man who was standing as a congressional candidate in the US turned to be turned out to be somebody who ran uh, an incel website with a specialist area for paedophiles to join and exchange tips. So, you know, it isn't it isn't so crazy to suggest that actually um, these groups have much more of a hold on policymakers than we might like to think, but also more broadly that if policymakers don't reflect the society that they're serving in terms of gender, but also in terms of race, ethnicity, disability, then it's unlikely that we're get a very fair hearing you know right now in the Westminster cabinet um, there are five women who attend cabinet out of 27 and one black person um, is it any surprise that we can't even get them to fund frontline sexual violence services let alone tackling something as nuanced as this that requires you to go on that journey of connections um, it's incredibly frustrating and we're a very very long way away from dealing with it because if you try to talk to policymakers about this form of radicalization or extremism, they won't recognize it. I rang one of the most prominent government organizations devoted to counter terror in this country to talk about these issues. And um, when I used the word incel, there was a long silence on the other end of the phone and I was asked to repeat myself. They rang back a couple of weeks later and said, we don't have any data or information in that area, but can we talk to you about this other thing? Um, it's just not on the radar. There's a, a government, a United States Government Accountability Office report that's literally holding them to account on their response to terrorism. Um, and during the period of the report, there were three massacres carried out by male supremacists, which don't show up in the report. But the report does track in great detail uh, animal rights extremism, people with extreme views on ownership of federal lands, on the environment and on uh, abortion, even though in the period of report, nobody had been killed in the name of those particular forms of extremism. It's just it's, it's not on the radar at all. And until it is, I don't know how we're going to convince people to take it seriously or to start taking action. I guess it reflects the the importance of calling it radicalization, of calling it a terror attack, of calling it an epidemic, rather than um, what are considered rare events that just happen to happen so frequently. Absolutely. Um, and it, calling it what it is becomes critical. I'm going to bring in um, Catherine Dawson. Catherine is the Sexual Violence Prevention Coordinator at Rape Crisis Scotland. Catherine, it's a lot to take in and even I'm feeling quite overwhelmed with everything, even though I knew what was coming. Um, but can you reflect um, a little bit on the work that you do, particularly on prevention around Rape Crisis, in Rape Crisis Scotland and across the movement, and also your reflections on what you've heard so far? Yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, just just for a bit of context then for anybody that's not familiar um you know our prevention work is um with young people in schools i know a lot of our prevention workers are here today so um you know we'll recognize a lot of the issues that laura's spoken about but for context we've got um we, we work across all local authorities in scotland working with you know in the region of sort of you know up to sort of 150 to 200 um, secondary schools every year with 21 workers who are going around, you know, and talking to young people um, about issues related to sexual violence. So, you know, cover a lot of these issues around gender, 
and around understanding the nature of sexual violence and what counts as sexual violence. Um, so in many ways, addressing these kind of issues. And in addition to that, doing some work as well on a whole school approach platform to support schools to be um, thinking sort of holistically about how they can handle these issues. So, you know, I think, you know, from conversations with colleagues doing that work, they're very much recognizing a lot of what you're saying there, Laura, about you know, a real sort of sea change, I think, in the kinds of attitudes that they're meeting. They were always sort of ready to, you know, part of just the bread and butter of the work was engaging with, you know, just sort of those everyday um, attitudes around, you know, sort of gender and questions around, um, you know, things that sort of reflect societal myths about rape, but from young people who were bringing those questions quite openly and ready to engage and, you know, happy to learn and, and happy to, to, you know, hear what the work is to say and really engage with that. Um, but then I think, you know, gradually a sense of, 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 of relatively small number of young people, um, you know, who were, who were really very sort of ready to be resistant, you know, and as you were saying, Laura, had sort of very ready arguments um, against, you know, sort of fake statistics and things like that, ready to kind of debunk the sort of feminist agenda, um, you know, so often quite hostile. Um, and even though it wasn't the of young people in the room you know it was really sort of um you know derailing the conversation and you know probably quite frustrating for a lot of the other young people in the group there that wanted to, to learn as well um so you know i think reflecting on you know on on what we're talking about today um i think it's important that we're continuing and others are also sort of continuing to engage with the kinds of you know the, the the sort of normal attitudes and understanding of of sexual violence um I think there's something about us taking a more pre sort of proactive approach. You know, actually, if we can be engaging with young people before they um, are exposed to these kinds of grooming ideologies, so that at, when they come to meet those, perhaps they recognize a little bit of it already and they've got a little bit of a filter to, oh, OK, you know, I've actually heard something about this in advance. And I think that's something that we can sort of be discussing about how we do that more proactively. Um, but I think there's something there also for the sort of wider um, partners and education system system in thinking about you know how well equipped are schools to um, understand and recognize kinds of issues you know we heard of an example where a colleague raised some concerns with a school about the attitudes of a young man that she'd met in a workshop and the school was to some extent aware that he was you know he, his attitudes were quite problematic but there was a sense that they didn't really recognize what, what it was and, and didn't really feel that they were equipped to deal with it you know we're aware that our colleagues um, can be faced you know, quite, it, it can be quite a hostile environment for them. Some of it can be very personal and targeted towards them. That will also be true for female teachers as well, you know, particularly younger female teachers. So, um, you know, I think there is, that does need to be that kind of, yeah, broader, broader recognition and, and joint um, approach as to how we can be more proactively um, working with it. Thank you, um, Catherine. Really critical work that Reprice Scotland is doing. I have been inundated with questions of course I have because there's so much to unpick here and there's so much to ask I'm going to try and um, bring together questions that would apply to both of you and the work that you've done um, and I will kind of um, amalgamate the questions so that we can get through as much as possible um, we've had one question which is how do we tackle these conversations with men and boys particularly in a classroom settings have you found any particular education tactics which work better than others to change the minds which don't believe sexism exists or other tactics that produce better outcomes mm -hmm. so um catherine and then i'll go to laura just sure, to put you on yeah. spot, catherine yes <laughs> That's fine. It's something that we talk about a lot. You know, I think the, you know, the approach to engaging with boys and young men is a very sort of an open hearted one in that, you know, we recognise um, that the majority of boys and young men, um, you know, have, have the sort of capacity to be able to engage positively with these kinds of issues and given the right sort of opportunities to, um, you know, to sort of align themselves with, you know, with the sort of social justice side of things and to, to not see it as being, you know, something where um, they need to sort of be alienated or threatened or anything like that. So I think that it's very much about, you know, engaging, recognising some of the things when we talk about violence against women and girls that might initially 
actually be sort of difficult or sort of feel a bit threatening, you know, when we're talking about gender and we're talking about, you know, patriarchy and things like that, just recognizing that we need to sort of, um, you know, engage, you know, do that in a way with boys and, and young men that invites them to be part of the solution and you know, that workers, you know, my colleagues in uh, the, the rape crisis centers who are going into schools are sort of very actively doing that. Um, I think there's also a sense that if you encounter these attitudes in the space of, you know, a, um, a sort of a 40 minute workshop, even if that's a series, of, you know, a few 40 minute workshops with the same group, um, we, we can't. To, to change the views of an individual who's got really, really firm views about it. So I think that's that sort of speaks to the argument about coming in as early as possible. And they're already being a sort of a found, um, you know, of, of um, welcoming of genderity and, and, and recognizing of gender inequality that's sort of been reinforced through education um, so that when we have these discussions with them, there's a kind of a readiness rather than a, a, a guardedness instead. Thank you. Laura, what about yourself? And uh, you've obviously written about your experiences of working with young people. Have you found any particular tactics or any any way in which um, minds can be changed? Mm -hmm. Well, I would absolutely agree with everything that Catherine said. It's much easier to prevent someone being radicalised in the first place than to try and change their mind and de-radicalise them afterwards. So early intervention is crucial. Um, I think for me, the exciting thing about this is that there is an answer to everything. There is no argument made on the manosphere, no statistic that they share that, that, that doesn't have an answer to it. You know, whether it's the, um, whether it's the idea that, that false rape allegations are incredibly common, which we can debunk with very, very robust statistics, um, or, or even if it's something like looking at the, um, the situations that affect men. So I think for me, it's about meeting head on the moments where they expect you to cower and run away because they think they've been given these kind of gotcha trump cards and they'll often come in with them written down on a notebook and be really sort of excited to confront you with them and the idea is that you're going to kind of crumble um, and so I really welcome the opportunity to tackle it I'd rather have those conversations openly with them and answer because there is an answer for everything rather than have them kind of sweep it under the carpet um, I think you have to try and just be prepared to be flexible um, at one school I went out on stage and 400 boys had all arranged in advance they all started wolf whistling as I stepped out to give my presentation all in unison and it was really overwhelming but at the same time in the in the moment I said great thank you for our first example and we talked about that and we started out we started there started by talking about what that meant that I was a woman who'd been invited in to talk to them and that was their first response um, when I'm talking to boys about online porn and I think they're expecting to be kind of told off and, and told that they're evil or wrong for watching it. Instead, I sometimes focus on an idea of uh, if they are heterosexual boys and, and want to have sex with, with women in the future. Um, it's interesting to know that what they see in online porn won't necessarily help them to do that in the way that women will enjoy. Um, you know, taking kind of approaches that they might not necessarily anticipate. Um, but for me, I think the answer to this isn't necessarily what any individual educator can do. It's more about whether or not the school is prepared to take this seriously and implement a whole school approach. Because ultimately, if you've got a school where these attitudes are really ingrained and you can really tell when you go into schools, because in schools where it's particularly bad, the girls are silent. They don't comment. They don't put their hand up. And the boys are very belligerent and they have really accusing and angry questions that don't listen to anything that you've actually said. In those schools, I'm not going to magically win over hundreds of boys with 40 minutes to talk to them, but the school could. The school could change things. If they made it not a one-off tick box exercise, but something that they're talking about across the curriculum, not just in PSHE. If they looked at the kind of text that they're studying in English and whether there's diversity in the musicians and composers that they're looking at in music, at who's coming into the school to talk and what kind of diversity is there. If they look at how the school responds to sexual violence, if I go into school and talk about these issues and then the next week a girl is suspended because a boy puts his hand up her skirt and gropes her and the school says it was her fault for wearing a short skirt, then my message is not going to get through. Um, Buy-in from male leadership teams has a massive impact and schools who ask you to talk to parents and to teachers as well as young people, in my experience, that tends to be a lot more successful as an intervention because it then gives those adults in those young people's lives the tools to continue the conversation and to bolster it. So I think actually there's a lot that schools can do and, and there's such a variety of brilliant resources, you know, for schools where there's a particular problem, I'd recommend something like the Good Lad Initiative and um, their facilitator 
facilitators are young men who are role models to those teenage boys who come in and talk to them. And in fact, one of them is Ben Hurst, the lead facilitator. I interviewed him for the book and he has some really interesting insights in, in the book about what's successful in terms of interventions. He feels that a lot of the hostility expressed is actually fear at its root. And he gives young people a non-judgmental space to try and get to the root of those fears. He says when a young boy says 90% of rape allegations are false, what he's really saying is I'm scared I'll be accused of rape. And if you can get to the bottom of that, if you can get past that hostility and address those fears, then he feels that that's a really good approach. So I think there's a number of different things. Yeah, you said a number there and it's really critical. What's really come out to me is the over-reliance on that one teacher who is usually a woman who is trying to do what she can in the space she's given in a school with the school around her not giving her the support, the education sector not taking it seriously. And whether we're talking about the workplace, whether we're talking about parliament, whether we're talking about schools, a whole organisation approach works, not ad hoc one woman taking on the emotional labour of, of trying to create change. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Emma Rich, who's the Executive Director of Engender, to tell us a little bit more about the work that Engender's doing and also some reflections on what Laura's already said. Hi, Emma. Hi, Tala. Thanks. It's really lovely to be here. And thanks, um, Laura, for all you've said so far. Um, I think one of the things that Engender um, does is make the connection between what we're seeing as a kind of uprush of misogyny and the equality work that we do so we work on women's economic equality social and cultural equality and political equality and i really love the the work that you've done to chart just how much um, misogyny is overlooked as a, a critical um, feature of uh, really um violent and disruptive social movements and i think the work that you've done to describe terrorism and just how missing incel um, ideologies are from that is really, really compelling. Um, I love the idea um, that Kate Mann talks about in her book about misogyny being about women in a man's world rather than women in a man's mind. And I think we see misogyny as being something which is trying to push women out of public spaces, whether that be online, uh, whether that be literally public spaces in terms of street harassment, um, or whether that be in education and workplace settings. Um, and I think over um, the last uh, 10 or so years, there's definitely been an increase in some of the online uh, violence against women, including violence against women in politics, um, which is creating a real chilling effect on women's um, capacity uh, to be involved in political representation and in making decisions about our world, all of which obviously is kind of circular in terms of undermining women's equality and further and um, driving women away from um, decision making. Um, so I think what we have seen is uh, um, throughout history, violence against women organizations have done work to chart misogyny, uh, to name the power relations that act as a scaffold uh, for women's experience of men's violence and have done some really creative work of which I see your book as being absolutely within the tradition of um, to name some of the phenomena that constrain women's lives, uh, to determine pathways to justice, to situate the blame and the responsibility, and to think about how we might get um, some kind of measure of equality and rights um, within our public spaces and institutions. Uh, so I think it's been really, really um, hugely positive to hear about some of the work that you have done within schools. And I particularly loved the story um, of the school that you went back to year after year and eventually noticed um, a difference in the environment of the school that, that, that talking to you each year um, seeded a feminist um, group within the school and ultimately shifted the culture. So I think you give us hope for the future as well as charting some of the really um, difficult and dark corners of the internet that we need to grapple with as a matter of urgency. Thank you, Emma. We have uh, 15, 16 minutes and a lot of questions. So I'm going to try and get through as much as I can because people are engaged and um, they want to hear from you all. Um, let me start off with um, thresholds. So a few people have asked about um, how do we challenge the sort of misogyny that falls below a threat or targeted abuse, but makes the internet feel unsafe and is a stepping stone if, if allowed for somebody to become threatening and abusive um, and um, 
perhaps on the path that you're talking about, Laura, how do we um, tackle that and challenge that, um, particularly uh, online? Well, I think the first thing is to join the dots, to recognise the importance of challenging these apparently minor instances. Um, that's what we're completely and utterly failing at at the moment. Um, you know, we know we've just seen this, this survey about 97% of women uh, experiencing street harassment uh, in the UK. Um, we know that 1.5% of cases of rape reported to the police lead to a charge or summons. So what possible hope does anybody have that they report something apparently minor and that gets taken seriously? So I think we have to fix the system essentially in order to get people to be able to recognize that it's okay to challenge the smaller stuff. But we have to recognize the connections between it. We have to reach a point where our media doesn't put you on the front page with the word feminazi above your head if you dare to raise an issue of sexual, sexual harassment because that sets the tone for our whole society for what's acceptable acceptable and what's normalized. Um, so it's about policy shift, it's about media shift, it's about changing that cultural normalization of those low level behaviors. And actually, I think when it comes to challenging it, which is so difficult, particularly for women, when we're so often likely to be railed against, to be told that we're overreacting, that we're harridans, that we're feminazis, that we're ball breakers, that we're making a fuss about nothing, that we're rocking the boat to lose our jobs, to see us sidelined in our careers if we try to challenge those minor things. For me, this is a really good answer to all of those men asking, what can I do? How can I be an ally? And the answer is challenge the small stuff because actually we can't necessarily do it. We're not taken seriously, we're ridiculed and we risk seeing real negative repercussions, but you can because you're not in that same vulnerable position. So all of these men saying, well, you know, I never see the really serious stuff happening. That's okay, challenge the small stuff. You know, there was, there's a, a, an activist called Te Kelly Temple who was asked once um, how we can make space for men in feminism. And she said that men need to take the spaces in their world that are already theirs, male dominated spaces and make space there for feminism. And I think that's really true. You know, this is a really good option of a place where those men can start, have those small conversations, challenge the tricky things, the uncomfortable things where you risk being seen as somebody making the fuss. Take that off us for a while. Thank you. You actually um, mentioned about um, the this becoming pulling into mainstream media, although it feels far away at the moment. How can mainstream media perhaps do something to stem the flow? How can it be a positive, a force for good to try and push back on this? And and Emma, what do you think can be done to highlight this and put this on the radar of politicians who don't see it as being something, who don't join those dots and don't see it as being important to the everyday work that they're doing? I think from a media perspective, it's really about two things. It's about what they cover and it's about how they cover it. So you can spend, you know, hours and hours desperately emailing, contacting people, trying to get them to cover period poverty or um, migrant women and their lack of access to domestic abuse spaces. And instead, you just get bombarded with emails from media outlets. Literally, these are real examples saying, will you come on to debate whether um, whether Kleenex man-sized tissues are sexist? Is a men working overhead sign sexist? countless questions about debates about wolf whistling, um, man flu, fact or fiction, has feminism gone too far? Do we really need International Women's Day anymore? So partly it's about this obsessive focus of the media very deliberately on the really, really minor things, which actually no feminist often is even talking about in order to kind of prop up this straw argument that feminists are just angry women who are going completely mad over tiny, tiny things when they don't cover the real issues. And then it's about the way in which they cover those issues when they happen. So just this morning, for example, the Today programme gave someone a platform to go on and say that women are hysterical and overreacting. And that gives such credibility to that idea which when young men will then encounter those ideas in the manosphere is bolstered by that mainstream acceptability the today program also questioned whether me too was a witch hunt they used those words to describe it we've also got mainstream media programs which will only have you on to talk about any of this stuff if you'll come on with somebody with you to say i think it's nonsense i think women are actually using their sexiness deliberately to get ahead at work i think men are the real victims um, and there's a real parallel here, I think, to the media treatment of climate change, you know, for so, so long, and even sometimes still, uh, climate change activists couldn't come on and really get the important message across because they had to waste half of their time arguing with climate skeptics. And, and I think we have to recognize that when we talk about balance in the media, there are ways to interpret that that don't have to mean undermining actual facts. So you could have on two women with different ideas about how to fix the problem, fine, have a debate. 
but you know the way that the media approaches this is is really part of the problem there was a period during the research i did for the book when the reporting of women who cried rape in Daily Mail headlines outstripped the actual number of false rape allegations by nearly double. So the media has such a role to play in spreading and normalizing those complete misconceptions. And it's a huge goal for the, for the online extremists who celebrate it. They're obsessed with what they describe as the Overton window, which is sort of the, the bracket of publicly acceptable discourse. And they say that if the media and public figures like Donald Trump say things that shift it in their direction, then suddenly what they say seems much less shocking and it's much easier for them to get their claws into new recruits. So nodding my head furiously, Emma. On politicians, I mean, if there are any MSPs on this session right now, I would really advise that they join the cross-party group on men's violence against women, uh, which hears from women's organizations all the time on that exercise that Laura described of joining the dots. I think other than that, um, we really see a lot of enthusiasm among many of the female parliamentarians in the Scottish Parliament for some of these issues and many have come from our movement and our world and so electing more women I think that are feminist is got to be one of the key goals for our movement too um, and thirdly I think that women's organizations across Scotland all of us have long spent time trying to join those dots and make visible the links between women's inequality and women's rights with violence against women and misogyny and we'll continue to do that work but um, absolutely you can go and talk to your MSP anytime about some of these things and flagging um, the issues that Laura's talked about today in terms of insult ideologies and the radicalizing power of the internet and please do talk to your elected members about those that's really important. Thank you, Emma. We've had a few questions that have come in that are about the hate crime bill that we um, that was debated just last night. Um, so to bring them all together, um, in Scotland, we've just seen a lot of debate around the hate crime bill with expert women's organisations making the case that adding sex into existing legislation won't actually have an impact on the types of misogyny that we're talking about in this um, in, in this session. What legislation do we actually need to interrupt this hate? Um, Emma, I'll go to you first and then Laura and Catherine. Thanks, Tala. That's a really good question. And I think um, when we've been working on this for about five years, I would say, along with other um, expert women's organisations, including Rape Crisis and Scottish Women's Aid and Zero Tolerance. And we spoke to a lot of violence against women experts in and outside of Scotland, as well as drawing on the um, mass consultation that Scottish Women's Convention did with women and communities. And there's a couple of reasons why adding sex would not make any difference at all. Um, uh, the first is that effectiveness, um, so adding sex to the hate crime law wouldn't create any new laws, it would just add a label to existing crimes, so that a judge when um, a crime was prosecuted in front of him or her um, would just have the option, or sorry, rather he, would, he or she would have to think about whether to add um, to the sentence based on the aggravation of hate. So it doesn't create new offences um, that would tackle misogynistic offences that aren't um, currently existing in the law. Um, the second thing is that it would be symmetrical. So if you add a sex aggravator, it would apply to men as well as women. And we know from our sisters in the domestic abuse world um, that we see a lot of vexatious reporting um, by perpetrators of victims so that women are falsely accused of domestic abuse when they haven't um, committed that crime. And um, it can really um, damage women's lives and be used as part of coercive control. And so domestic abuse services were concerned that that would have a similar impact. Um, the second thing is um, that there is a kind of international standard for what violence against women laws look like, and they should absolutely be specific. So things like our domestic abuse law in Scotland are gold standard um, because they accurately um, capture the dynamics of domestic abuse as it is perpetrated within households uh, and it's rooted in power and patriarchy. Um, whereas because um, a sex aggravator in a hate crime doesn't work like that, isn't really understood um, as hate crime because 
um, hate crime is so associated with populism, where it's been introduced around the world, such as in New Jersey, and even piloted in England, it's made absolutely no difference. So we've seen levels of reporting of about one incidence a year, um, even in areas where populations have had millions of people. So it, it basically just doesn't work for women uh, and potentially um, robs attention and focus and implementation funds and attention from solutions that would actually work uh, for women and girls. I appreciate that this is um, Scotland specific legislation. I don't know if you want to come in or we can move on to another question. Um, I don't know about that specific piece of legislation, but I, I totally would um, take on board everything that Emma said. I wonder if we need to look at specific legislation around street harassment, because currently, if you report something that happens in the street to the police, there are various kind of often quite antiquated laws that it kind of falls under, that they can kind of bring it under. But that's not particularly useful, especially not if you're reporting it to a, a police officer who isn't particularly sympathetic or taking it seriously. Um, I would say that when Nottinghamshire police did their very successful pilot of recording misogyny as a hate crime, what they saw was that women were coming forward with existing offences that were extremely serious, things like abuse and assault and kidnapping in one case, it was an abduction, um, stalking, but they were women who wouldn't necessarily have come forward otherwise. And it was the fact that they were doing this big pilot project and that they were emphasising to the public that they were recording misogyny hate crime that emboldened those women to have the confidence that they'd be taken seriously. So maybe what we need to take away from this is not necessarily the hate crime aspect, but the aspect of retraining police and actually um, sending the message to communities and to women in communities that particular um, behaviours will be taken seriously and can be reported to police. And, and that's something we could look at, I think. Yeah, one, one of the things we called through uh, for throughout the process was an expert working group on misogynistic offences to try and look at what the gaps are in the law. And mm -hmm. I think public street harassment law is exactly one of those. I think the Nottinghamshire example is really fascinating um, because it did um, bring forward some reports of very serious offences, um, but didn't really address the kind of gap that people were hoping hate crime would address, which is those kind of public offences that, as you say, are very poorly covered in Scotland as well as England and Wales. Catherine and Laura, um, for both of you, um, we've had somebody ask, um, how do you have these conversations with family and friends where it can be emotional and difficult um, and often creates even more problems within the household as well? So how, how do you have those conversations with the people you, you love and you detect that their behaviour or their attitudes are um, going in a direction that might be dangerous? I think this is probably the hardest question to answer and it's also one of the ones I'm asked the most frequently. Um, I think I would acknowledge that that is so hard if you're experiencing these things from people close to you and in environments where you should feel safe that is so hard for you. And there isn't any right or wrong way to deal with that and if it's making it much worse you don't have to feel that it's your feminist responsibility to tackle it you have to do what you need to do to feel as safe as you can feel. Um, I think the answer in terms of what techniques can help with those difficult conversations, I think the first thing for me is little and often. If you sit someone down for a big serious conversation about this, honestly, they can immediately react with such knee jerk defensiveness that you're not going, you're not getting anywhere. They feel like they're being accused of something. So I think pointing out the little things, picking up on it, you know, when you walk past the billboard where the woman's naked and the man's fully clothed, when you're in the supermarket and you notice that under the men's magazines, you've got the New Statesman and the National Geographic and the the new scientist and the economist um, when when incidents like the ones of the past week crop up in the news pointing them out little and often so that they start to experience that sort of drip 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 that we as women experience on a daily basis can be a kind of more accessible way to kind of ease into the conversation the other thing i would say and this is very complicated because we shouldn't have to do this and you don't have to do this but when we hear from men who've been really shocked and have kind of opened their eyes to the problem, it's often because women in their lives have sat them down and said, listen, you're dismissing this, but these are the six things that happened to me today. This is what happened to me last week. It started when I was eight, actually, and this is what happened. And when I was 15, this happened. And at work last week, this happened. Now, no woman should have to do that. We don't owe people our trauma and our experiences, and it shouldn't take a woman that a man is related to to force him to see it. But if you are struggling to get a man in your life to open his eyes and it's a man who cares about you deeply and who dismisses this stuff, and if you feel strong enough and able to do that, that can be something that really, really shocks them to their core and, and just makes forces them to realise, oh, I had no idea that this was such a huge part of your life. 
Catherine, a couple of thoughts from you. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything that Laura had said. And uh, I suppose the only other thing I was going to add was that, you know, quite often the the um, the points that um, say, you know, people, men who are sort of, you know, questioning or hostile or, or you know, critical of, of the points that feminists are making might sort of lead the discussion down certain rabbit holes or certain sort of things that they're particularly focused on. So I think just trying to refocus it back to what are the main points that we know need to be focused on, you know, rather than sort of wasting all the energy sort of refuting sort of spurious points, try and bringing it back to sort of the core issues that, that we know are important. Thank you. Laura, we've had a lot of comments um, and just to say you're, we're coming to the end now, so you're all, not all questions have been answered. I appreciate that. There were so many, um, but a lot of the questions will um, be answered if you read the book. So a plug to buy and read the book because actually quite a few of these will be uncovered in what Laura has brilliantly written. And Laura to, and we've had lots of comments as well, Laura, just saying thank you for writing this, thank you for doing the work on it and, and uh, really heartening messages of support for you as well. Laura, just to wrap up, um, what gives you hope? After doing all this research, what gives you hope about progress? Um, well, I think first of all, the fact that we are not letting it go, you know, the outcry that we've seen in the past 24 hours, we are not taking this lying down, we will continue to push and to demand those systemic changes that we have to see. Um, we will continue to hold policymakers to account. The public conversation around this has transformed in the last 10 years, and that doesn't mean that the problem is fixed or that it's gone away whatsoever, but it is a first step that we had to make. We couldn't get people to tackle this problem when the problem was invisible and people were saying it didn't exist. And I think that we are getting to the point where you can't really say that anymore, this outpouring of incredible courageous women who have come forward and forced people to acknowledge the problem. That gives me hope, but of course we need to see response to that robust systemic response. And at an individual level, I, I hear from so many young women and girls who are in such innovative and bold ways standing up to this, refusing to take it lying down, you know? Um, girls who have um, been told by their school that they can't wear leggings because it distracts the boys from their maths, coming up to school the next day with posters and placards that say, um, are my leggings lowering your test scores? Um, girls at one school I visited who were, it was an all girls school and a local boys school was coming together with them for the talk I was giving about sexism. And they saw the boys on social media in the morning spouting off about feminism feminism being nonsense and how this talk would be awful and they were planning to be very disruptive and the girls turned up a few minutes early at the auditorium and spaced themselves out in every other seat throughout the whole hall so that when the boys arrived they were forced to sit in between two girls and it completely took the wind out of their sails and we ended up having a really good discussion. There are so many of these stories where people have found their own way to tackle it. Um, and for men as well, a man wrote that he'd read the Everyday Sexism Project and it had suddenly opened his eyes to what street harassment feels like for women. And, and he just hadn't really thought about it. And a few days later, he was walking down the street and some men up ahead started shouting at some women, shouting, get your tits out. And he said, I panicked because I wanted to do something, but I wasn't quite sure what and how, how should I address it? And in the end, I just lifted up my T-shirt and I showed them mine instead. And it's a really silly minor thing, but it was his way of saying, you wouldn't do this to me, so don't do it to them. And there are lots of stories like that, I think, where people are finding ways that they can tackle it in their own sphere. It, it can feel very overwhelming, but actually, if all of us were to start to disrupt that normalization, then it could make a big difference. Laura, thank you so, so much. Thank you for doing the work behind this. Thank you for being a, a relentless campaigner. Thank you for giving us this piece of strength for us to have the information and to go forward and and um, take on what we can in the space that we occupy and hopefully for more men to do that too. Emma and Catherine, thank you so much for your inputs. Thank you to Rape Price of Scotland and Engender for inviting me along to cheer today. It's been a real privilege to be able to hear this. What I will say though, is even though I'm cheering it and I, and I do this work, I have found some of the conversation difficult and over, overwhelming, especially, especially given the context of the last 24 hours. It would be regardless, but given that. So can I please uh, recommend that if you need to, please reach out. Um, in the chat, chat function, we've put up Rape Crisis Scotland's helpline. There's also the Amna Muslim Women's uh, Resource Centre helpline, mental health crisis helplines. If you need to, please reach out. I know it's even harder during a pandemic because you can't hug in solidarity your sister who understands this. 
Um, but please know that uh, there are people that are there for you and um, a whole sisterhood across Scotland who has your back. Thank you so much for being part of this and I look forward to seeing you all and working with you all to tackle patriarchy soon.